All right, I need some volunteers. I got some guys coming. Brother Gibbs, if you'll come up here. Today you're going to live right down here. This is the Apostle Paul. You can bring your Bible, brother. And then over here, Brother Mark. This over here is the church at Philippi. And that over there is Italy. I know it doesn't look like Italy to you, but it is Italy. And you're the church at Philippi, and this is your treasurer. And so, hey, you give him money, he gives it to missions. Um, then we have Epaphroditus. Oh, Jacob's volunteered to be a good guy. And Brother Gibbs... Italy is really over to your left about 12 feet. Surprised you didn't know that. Okay. So, now, look at it, what it says in verse 15. I want you to see this carefully. He says, Ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia. So, right, Paul is... The apostle to the Gentiles. We say he's a missionary. It's missions time, so we'll say he's a missionary. He left his home country, went to a foreign field, and he started churches. But we know he's actually more than that, right? Especially anointed, called of God, apostle to the Gentiles. He went up to Asia Minor, started churches, reported back to the church at Antioch, went back up and was confirming the churches, and he heard the Macedonian call. Now Macedonia is where Philippi is. Macedonia is the northern region of Greece. And so the gospel to Europe, the gospel to the Gentiles. The apostle to the Gentiles goes, he meets Lydia the seller of purple. He meets the Philippian jailer. A church gets started at Philippi. When he leaves, he goes down and boy just... A little ways down is Thessalonica. And the church at Philippi sent support to him right there. And then Berea. And then on down to Corinth and Athens. And everywhere Paul went, this church sent. Look what it says in verse 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia... No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Now let's get a couple things just straight, just kind of they lay there like a mackerel on the beach. Number one, your giving for missions should be through a church. It was the church that did the communicating concerning giving and receiving. So when we say give to missions through your local church, that's the Bible foundation for it. That's what they did. I have a guy come up to me and say, hey, Pastor King, uh, here's a hundred dollar bill and uh, I want you to, you to give it to missions. And I took it and I put it in my wallet and I said, thanks. He says, that wasn't for you. I said, look, you should have put it in the offering plate. If you're just trying to impress me with how generous a giver you are, you've already lost the blessing if you're trying to impress people with it, just give it to the work of God Almighty and stay anonymous, right? I mean, you give through the church. Then notice what it says, you send once and again, verse number 16, under my necessity. Hear me carefully. The Apostle Paul, after his missionary journeys, was in Jerusalem, betrayed, sent on the ship, Eurocladon. Oh, you guys probably... Wow. I... You slip over to Acts 27. Paul is taken from Jerusalem to Rome, right? He appeals to Caesar. He goes on this ship. And while he's on that ship, they have this huge storm... Eurocladin, right? And he's stranded. Everybody familiar with that? Well, there are things that I see in the Bible that the average person doesn't see. So make sure you look at this. Acts chapter 27. This is free now. You don't have to pay for this. This is 
extra, it's bonus. But did you know the Bible says that once women got their driver's license, nobody could go to heaven? Yeah, yeah. It's right there, Acts 27, look at verse 15. What are the last four words? Verse 15 of Acts 27, the last four words. We let her drive. And then look at the last four words of verse 17. Is it, and so we're driven? Is that what it says? And then what's the last half of verse 20? All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. <laughs> if you're a Jehovah Witness, that's how you handle the Bible. See, you can prove anything if you just take things out. Anyway, never mind, that doesn't count. That's, but from where Paul is, he's the first guy let out of the ankle bracelet program. He's awaiting trial in the Mamertine prison. But he's allowed to be out in his own household while he's waiting for this. While he's there, he writes prison epistles. But the point I'm making is he's in a place where he can't go get a job and support himself. When he was in uh, Thessalonica, he made tents. When he was in Corinth, he made tents. He didn't want to be chargeable to them or have them think he was a freeloader. But here, now he can't. And I know we're kind of used to the way we do the prison system in the U.S., but all through history and all around the rest of the world, they give you a blanket and a pail to go in and a cup of water and a potato or a piece of bread, and that's it. And if you're going to get more than that, your family has to bring it in. And so he's dependent on people to help him. Now, in that same way, most missionaries, when they go to a foreign country, they have to sign a paper that says they won't take a job because the country considers them taking jobs away from, a uh, from someone who's from that country, a, a national. And so they have to show, hey, I get support. Once in a while, somebody can get into China on a work visa instead of a missionary visa because they can teach English as a second language or something, but most missionaries around the country, around the world, cannot get a job, so they're dependent on us to support them. And I notice that he says in verse 16, you send once and again unto my necessity. Missionaries, they had shoes on their feet two years ago. Do you think they still want shoes this year? Right? They had a, a car last year. Do you think they still need a car this year? They ate last month. They want to eat again this month. Right? I'm saying it's an ongoing, once and again, giving to their necessities. Another thing we can just observe here, in just in the passing of it, he said, you gave through the church. You gave once and again. And then notice... He says, I have, verse 18, I have received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an order of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing. He said, hey, it was such a blessing, such a joy. It's not wrong for a missionary to have something nice. You actually have a bicycle. It's okay if he has a bicycle. You have a rug on your floor. It's okay if he has a rug on his floor. It's not wrong for them. They didn't take an abject vow of poverty that says, I'll never have anything nice. We had a missionary lady come to our church and she was crying and she said, I know this probably doesn't mean much to you guys, but I'm really praying that one of the churches, now that we're back on furlough, would give us a jar of Skippy peanut, peanut butter. I, the, the, the chunky kind the stuff they have over there just tastes terrible. And would it be wrong for me to have some chunky, skippy peanut butter? One of our ladies brought her a case of it. I don't know how they got it back, but 
I'm saying it's not wrong. Don't, don't despise a missionary having some nice things or be well cared for. The verses we read, I can do all things through Christ. Missionaries that you know, he says, I've learned how to abound. I've learned how to be abased. Most of them are not crybabies. They go through hard times and they just hunker down and do what they have to do to get the job done. I can do all things through Christ. That's a missionary talking, saying, look, hey, I get my bucket filled from the top. I'm not waiting for you. I'm trusting God, and with his help, I can do anything he's called me to do. It's such a wonderful thing. Verse 17, where it says that I desire fruit that abounds to your account, right? You give, God ministers through the missionary, souls are saved, but God's going to count that record to your account. And then verse 19, that we see, he says, well, my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is not a universal promise. That's to Christians who give unselfishly to the ministry. You don't get to claim that unless you're having a part in this. He says to the Philippians, hey, look, God's going to take care of you because of this. But now Paul is in Rome. They sent once and again to his necessity. Thank you, church at Philippi. You're a good church. They sent once and again. He gets money from the treasure or chickens or whatever he gets. And he goes to where Paul is. In this case, Paul is in Rome. And Rome is on the southwest side of Italy. When you look at the Mediterranean Sea, there's two big peninsulas sticking down. Greece and Rome. They're just big Rock ledges are just mountain ranges that are sticking up out of the water. From there to the northeast side of Greece where Philippi is, it's a 55-day walk. If you make 10 miles a day walking on this mountain range. You understand, this isn't the U.S. Post Office. This isn't Pony Express or FedEx or UPS. This isn't Facebook or TikTok. If a letter's going to get from Paul to the church at Philippi, this is Epaphroditus. And so Epaphroditus comes back. The church cares about Paul. How's Paul doing? Hey, tell him we're praying for him. How's his health? What's going on? Everybody. And now... Once and again, they send to his necessity. Isn't this wonderful? I love it. This is the way it works. Church, a missionary goes. You promise to help him. You send once and again unto his necessity. Epaphroditus is the carrier. He is your messenger, but he's Paul's minister. He gives you the messages and carries your love to the apostle Paul. This is wonderful. Paul's not a beggar, but he's certainly in desperate need. And so, hey, thank God for guys like you. And really, I want to make a big deal out of Epaphroditus. Christians that are in the local church, you've been there long enough. Um, Christians that are in the local church that have a heart for the church, but also a heart for missions, they're worth their weight in gold. And so, what a blessing to have guys like this. And I want you to know, when in our church, and I'm sure in your church, the people that are actually just, I mean, Epaphroditus isn't a pastor. Epaphroditus isn't a missionary. He's just the guy carrying the stuff. But this time, he comes, and lo and behold, the church at Philippi has nothing to give him. Now they care, they love Paul, but they don't have anything to give him. So on his way back, Epaphroditus, hey, he stops, he gets a job, he helps a guy split wood, he helps uh, shear some sheep, he helps roof a house, he gets 721 shekels. If you could read the Greek like I can, you'd know. And now he makes his way to the Apostle Paul. Why? 
because Paul still needs. Whether or not the church does what they're supposed to do, he still needs, doesn't he? So thank God for this guy. Wow, one guy carrying the whole weight of the burden. And so now he goes back and he comes to the church at Philippi and hey, they care, but they got nothing. They can't give him anything. Now, hey, God bless you. But he stops again, this time halfway to Rome. And this time he helps mow a lawn. He helps them breed their cattle. He I don't know, did they have artificial insemination? Back? But he does, pours a sidewalk, repairs their Ford truck, or camel, whatever. And he gets 816 shekels. And thank God for this guy. I mean, we got Mr. Zealous. We got Mr. Committed. We got Mr. Sacrificial here. What a blessing. But he's lost a few pounds. But thank God for guys like this. And he comes back and he comes to the church at Philippi. And boy, they got nothing. I don't know. Maybe the Ford plant closed in Philippi. I don't know. Maybe there was a famine. I don't know. Maybe there was trouble in the church. I don't know. I wasn't there in person. But, but you weren't there in person, were you, brother? <laughs> But this time, he goes and he stops and he gets work. And he works his finger to the bone. Hey, Paul needs, but by the time he's done now, he's on his hands and knees when he gets to Rome. And Paul, appreciative of the gift, thankful for the friendship. But he says, wow, you're a shadow of your former self. Your health is gone. You're not going anywhere till you get straightened up. What's going on here, buddy? Now, look with me carefully at verse 10 where we started. He says, I rejoice. This is the letter that you're reading, the one that he sent at the end of life. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last, right? Verse 15 said, at the first, you said, what's it again in the beginning? But he says, now at the last, when Paul's ready to die, your care of me hath flourished, what's that word? Again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Do you think they forgot about Paul? No. Do you think they lost track of where he was? Probably not. But for some reason, they could not give. And there was a season, a time, a gap in their giving. And he says, boy, I'm glad that now here at the very last, just before he dies, you were able to help some more again. So it teaches you, number one, that a church, even if they quit giving, they can get back on the horse and start giving. Your care of me has flourished again. Isn't that what it says? Now, one of the things that I want to make for a point tonight is this. Every church, if they had a guy like this, they'd try to run him through a copy machine. He loves the local church. He serves there. He does his best to support them. But he also loves missions. He cares about the missionary. He does his best to serve them. And yet, he flies beneath the radar. He's not the pastor or the missionary. But how important is the layman? Once in a while, a church will have Big Daddy Warbucks, hey? This is an unusually wealthy person. He sold a business or inherited some land or whatever it is. And I know a lot of churches where they have a guy who carries 80% of the church missions budget because he has the money to do it. And thank God he's willing to do that. I'm so glad. But what do you find out? You can take the most dedicated guy 
and wear him to a frazzle. You say, well, how do you know that happened? You didn't just make it up. Because I read chapter 2. Slip back to verse uh, 20 or so of chapter 2. Philippi, this is in the book that he's sending. Paul writing from Rome. Verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your estate, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He says, hey, I was going to send Timothy to check on you, for all seek their own, verse 21, not the things which are Jesus Christ, be ye know the proof of him, that is Timothy, that as a son with the Father he has served with me in the gospel, him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me, but I trust in the Lord, I also myself shall come shortly. He says, maybe I'll get out. Who knows what's going to happen? I was going to send Timothy to check on you. But look at the next verse. Yet, I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Right? The church's messenger, my minister. That's what he says. He says, I was going to send Timothy but then I thought it necessary to send Epaphroditus. Why? Why? Why is that a big deal? Look what he says. For he longed after you all. Epaphroditus longed for you or cared for you. And was full of heaviness. Why? Because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Now listen, how do you put a price on a Christian like this? He serves, he sacrifices, he puts himself last and others first. And then when the church at Philippi hears that he's sick, he goes, oh, oh, send me. Let me go. I want to show them I'm okay. I don't want them to make a big to-do over me. I don't want to be the center of attention. I don't want them to be concerned about me. There's a lot bigger things to worry about. Listen, listen to me. This kind of Christian who says, I don't need a plaque. I don't need a reward. I don't need to be the center of attention. I don't want to be mentioned, recognized, honored, worshipped. I'm just a layman here. I'm just serving the church. I'm just serving the missionary. You heard he'd been sick. And he goes, look, send me. Let me go back. Let me show them. I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't want them worried about me. He was full of heaviness because he had heard that he was sick. What does Paul say? Indeed, he was sick. He was sick. Watch what it says. This is very, very important. For indeed, he was sick. Verse 27 nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him, Philippi, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. What a loss it would have been for Paul to have lost Epaphroditus. I mean, these are one in a million guys. These guys are precious treasures to the church, but also to the missionary. Watch carefully. Receive him, verse 29. Here, church. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. You want to know who to make a big deal out of as far as what you respect and uphold and aspire to? Find a layman serving the church and missions. Hold such. Hold that caliber of guy. Hold that kind of Christian. Hold that lady that has that kind of heart, that kind of motive. Hold them in reputation 
And now watch, I didn't make this all up here. Verse 30, because that for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life. Why? To supply your lack of service to me. Oh, 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 church at Philippi, you feel bad? You feel bad? He's sick? Oh, you're worried? Oh, you're worried about him. Well, that's what happens when one guy tries to make up for what the whole church is supposed to be doing. You can have the most dedicated guy, but you can wear him to a frazzle. You can have the most committed Christian, but eventually he runs out of steam. You can have Big Daddy Warbucks who gives and gives and gives, but eventually he dies or goes broke. God never intended one person to make up for what everybody else is supposed to be doing. Don't expect somebody else to carry your end of the log. So I just told him, I said, hey, if the church is going to do more for missions, it's obvious it has to have more money. And so the pastor says it's going to cost $30 per family. So you, the family in the first row, I said, uh, listen, you're going to have to give $30 a month more for this to work. No, I don't care if you give it or not. I mean, that doesn't make any difference to me. Do it or don't do it. But if you're not going to do it, just be honest and say, I'm not going to do that. And then tell the people seating next to you, listen, you're going to have to do 60 because I'm not doing my 30. And then you, hey, you... You can't do 60, you're not going to do 60. I don't care, that's fine. Just say to the person here, listen, you're going to have to do 90. I'm not doing my part, you do 90. And God help you if you live on the end of the row. Right? God never intended for someone else to do your part. You just do your part. Many hands make light work, we all do our share. And God gets the glory, and you don't wear out the good Christians that were zealous. That's, it's just a simple thing. So you guys can be seated. So I want to I wanna just wrap up with what really happened in Philippi. It's a good church. They're doing right. They gave once and again. There came a time when they didn't. But now at the last, the cares flourished again. But do you think there's any hint at all about why they quit giving? There could be a hundred reasons. But here's been my experience. The devil gets in a church and stirs up strife and division and criticism and then people vote in the offering plate and vote with their feet and the church declines. And you know, the first thing they have to cut is missionaries. I've seen it over and over so much it can make me vomit. The first thing to go is the support of missions. I mentioned this morning, our job is to keep the bull healthy, <laughs> to keep the church healthy. Let's look at a few things in Philippians and we'll be done. Turn over to chapter 1. It's a good church. Paul writes this letter. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. It's a good church. Always in every prayer of mine making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel. Six, being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, even as meet for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart. It's a good church. He's commending them, not condemning them. It's a good church. But would it shock you when you get to verse 9? That he prays for them. And what do you suppose he prays for? I, and this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, and that ye may approve things that are excellent. Hmm, hmm. Hey, look, I, 
I'm praying for you. You're a good church, but boy, I'm praying that your love for one another would abound. Would it surprise you? You get down toward the end of the chapter, verse number 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast, watch, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Hmm. Looks to me like he's saying, let's make sure we're getting along, folks. Let's make sure we're working together, folks. Let's make sure there's not any strife or division, folks. Hmm, why would you have to write that to a good church? Because we know the devil's devices. Because we know how he operates. Don't take for granted the unity that you have at this church. The devil is always stirring up people. And, and, and they're finding things to complain about. But chapter 2, hmm, verse 2, fulfill ye my joy. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man at his own things, but every man also on the things of other. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hey, hey, get along. Make sure that you're not just... Advancing your petty agenda. Make sure it's not about your little world. Make sure it's not about you. How come my daughter didn't get to sing the lead part in the Christmas program? Because your daughter never could sing. Why did you call on that guy to pray instead of me? Because he's six foot six and you're five foot six. And when I looked out, I called him the tall guy. Had nothing to do with because I don't like you. People imagine evil surmisings are the tool of the devil. Oh, I mean, I had a guy, Brother King, you only talk. I notice when you shake hands with people, you say hi to everybody. But if a guy has a lot of money, you talk longer to him than other guys. He's keeping a scorebook. I wish I'd been smart enough to grovel up to the feet of the money guys, but I wasn't even that clever. But I'm saying, people will find something to complain about. So would it shock you? Look a little further down in chapter 2. It's a good church! But look at the warning. Verse number 14. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Why do you suppose you have to say that to a good church? Because if you're not having one of those battles now, you will be just around the corner. It didn't start with us. It's been going on a long, long, long time. All across the country, Baptist churches all around. They say, whenever there's a one good Baptist church in town, there's always two. You have to say, put your hand on the Bible and say, I don't agree, I don't agree, I don't agree. Okay, you're a Baptist. No, listen, listen. God wants us to get along. These admonitions are to a good church. Hey, make sure you're getting along. Look at Chapter 3. But it shock you in verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Why? Why? Hey, there are always going to be false teachers afoot. The division can come from within. It can be attacks from without. Today, here's what's common. Some guy will have some favorite internet guru that he loves to listen to, and this guy has some weird doctrine or some ism or some when, some whatever, and he'll say to it, some other church member, hey, listen to this. I never heard the pastor teach on this. Hey, this guy's got new insight in the Urim and Thummim. 
hey, this is a Jewish rabbi and he sees things different in prophecy. Hey, there's this guy here and he's been teaching on baptism for the dead and I never heard our pastor talk about it. And today, today, whatever a pastor says is under attack. The people in the pew are sitting there and the pastor says, hey, there's three different times Paul was in Rome and they go, hey, Google, how many times was Paul in Rome? The pastor says the King James Bible is the most reliable Bible. And they say, hey, Google, what's the most reliable Bible? The pastor says, spank your children when they got it coming. And they say, hey, Google, do you think I should spank my kids or not? It's not just a competing voice. They consider it a superior voice, an authoritative voice, an expert voice. The pastors are competing with that all across this country, everywhere. False teachers, local gurus, internet experts. And it's not going to get better. It's going to do nothing get worse. And the Bible says here, hey, watch out for false teachers. Don't let anybody cause murmuring and disputing within and don't let anybody bring false doctrine in from without. Why? Because we're trying to keep the unity. Why? Because a healthy bull will reproduce. Watch. Would it shock you? You get a little farther down in chapter 3. Verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect or mature be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. He's saying, look, get along, get along, everybody get along. Come on now, let's make sure we get along. Keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Make sure everybody gets along. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with an illustration. There's a guy who sings in the choir who has terrible, terrible breath. He sits right here. He's got the most terrible breath. And boy, when he's singing, the girl that stands in front of him used to have blonde hair. Now it's brown. It is so bad. The person that sat next to him, this side and that side, have both quit the choir. They can't stand it. The choir director, he goes, wow, this is a problem. Henry's got bad breath. And so he tries to solve it at the lowest possible level. Kind of shoot a shot across the bow. Hey everybody, look, we're in close proximity here and we're singing and we're projecting and singing from the diaphragm and all that. But wow, you got to watch your personal hygiene. Make sure you shower and clean your armpits and take a breath mint. And just to be sure, I got a little box of certs for anybody that wants some here, you can come get some. Why? He's not trying to hurt him, he's just saying, hey, come on. But this guy is slow on the uptake, he doesn't get it. He's still singing away and he's got bad breath, bad breath. Two more people quit the choir, the song director, choir director, he comes the next week, hey everybody look here, I clipped out the coupon. They got gallon jugs of Listerine on sale at Walmart, and you can each get one here. And hey, here is a whole case of breath mints for you, and he gives one to each person. But when he gets to Henry, he gives him a box full of those pink cellophane covered urinal pucks. Here, here, here. This maybe this will help you here. Uh, right? He, he's, he doesn't want to hurt him. It goes on one more week. He says, hey, hey, look, I don't know if you have to go to the doctor. Make sure you might have hoof and mouth disease. Maybe you got to go to the veterinary. He's trying not to hurt anybody. But the next week, the choir director quits. Now, hey, hey. The pastor, does it fall in his lap to deal with this? He's not going to have a choir. Now, 
He doesn't want to talk to Henry, but eventually somebody has to sit out across the desk, way across the desk, and say, it's you. It's you. You hate that. They don't have a class on that in Bible college. But it befalls the pastor to have to address the sticky situations. It wouldn't surprise you if you get to chapter 4 of Philippians. Verse 1, Therefore, my dearly beloved, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Euodias, verse 2, and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. He names them. How would you like to have your name show up one time in the Bible and it be in that verse? It's a good church. But can there be a troublemaker even in good churches? Now I've got to be careful. It's not my fault that it's two Greek women. They got songbooks out there, they can stone you. <laughs> Charles Finney said, I've only seen the devil in church three times, but he was wearing a skirt every time. <laughs> is that all there is to the story? I already told you more than I heard. Now listen. Men can be wicked too. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his deeds. Right? I mean, I'm not picking on gals. But listen, the devil will use anybody he can to cause strife in the church. There might have been a hundred other reasons. But eight times in a short book, delivered by Epaphroditus to the church at Philippi, he says, Hey, you guys... Make sure you're getting along. Let's make sure you're getting along. Let's not have any murmuring and disputing. Let's make sure we don't allow any false doctrine. Hey, let's make sure we have one mind. Let's make sure we're all getting together. Eight times? Do you think that's pure coinky dinky? Or do you think he knew we're going to need that reminder as a church? And I... I'm closing this, this one Sunday on missions with this. Do you have something worth protecting? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. God help you to not allow anybody from the inside to blow this up. Don't allow anybody from the outside chisel in and break it up. Why? Because if we can keep the church healthy, the outreach in the community... And the support of missions will naturally happen. All the commitment in the world. If this church has 10 people in it a year from now. You're not going to be able to do for missions what you think you can. <laughs>